So my name is Jamie Anderson and I'm here for the USB Leaders Angle. Uh, my talk today is on creative thinking uh, and why creative thinking? Because today we're living in a very volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world. Uh, so what I'm talking about is you know, how do you as an individual boost your creativity and very importantly how do you uh, foster collective creativity. Um, it'll be very interactive uh, but of course if you would like to see a condensed version of the talk uh, then you can watch the online version, uh, 15 minutes of that, and I hope you'll enjoy. Thank you. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, VUCA. And in a VUCA world, what we actually need is to develop a special skill. And that skill is creative thinking, because what we have to be able to do is see what other people see, but see something different. And that is actually the definition of creativity. It's seeing what other people see, but seeing something different. The first step in becoming creative is to think. <coughs> now, I know this might sound a little bit weird, but it's actually to think about the way you are thinking. And this is what we call metacognition. The ability to step away from yourself and say, you know what, I'm stuck. I'm, 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 I'm acting like a robot, I'm acting in an automated way, I'm not thinking actually about this problem. So metacognition becomes very important. Now there's also something else I have to communicate to you. Don't be creative all of the time. It upsets people. <laughs> when do you need to be creative? You need to be creative actually when you're stuck. Yeah? When you keep trying something and it's not working. Um, the other time you need to be creative is when stuff changes. And in fact, that's why creativity, I think, is really required today because of technological change. You know, we have the cloud, we have big data, we have mobility. These are fundamental changes which allow us to, to do things differently. And no one's going to die if we get it wrong, you know. We, now, that requires this idea of metacognition. You've got to step back and think about the way you're thinking. Now, let me give you an example of this. And one of my favorites, this is Doug Dietz, and I met him a few years ago working for GE Healthcare. Now, Doug Dietz is an engineer. You can tell by the shirt. This guy has a PhD in engineering, and he's got a master's degree in industrial design. So this is a, this is a very smart person heading up GE's healthcare division. Now, the business that he in, is in um, is, is this one. And everyone's you know, seen one of these. It's MRI scanning. Right now, MRI scanning, this is a mature technology you find in every, every large hospital in the world. Um, and it's a mature technology. Now, the, the thing with this technology is it's also designed for adults. Look at it. It's a big machine. Now, Anna's six. Think about if Anna's been to the doctor and there's a lump, a concern. And we now have to, under, we have to go with Anna to the hospital and you have to take her into this room for a scan. Now, everybody think of anyone who's had children at that age, five or six years old, how's Anna going to be thinking? What's, she going to, what's going to be going through her mind? She's afraid. If I walk my daughter Hannah into this room, there's going to be tears. There's going to be, she's going to be clinging on to me or mum. So this is a problem because when you scan a child through this machine, they have to lie perfectly still. So, of course, Doug Dietz is going around at the hospitals and the doctors are saying, we have a problem. The engineers put their heads together. What's the engineering solution to a wiggling child? Strap, Strap them down. You say, you're an engineer! <laughs> now, this is particularly an issue in the US because it's a private healthcare system. And every scan costs $800. What I'd like everyone to do now is stand up and in a group of five people, just the people behind you, next to you. Now, for the people in the back row, it's difficult to talk to the people behind, all right? <laughs> Go beside. And what I want you to do is in two minutes, give me a solution to this problem by thinking. Everybody stand up and let's talk with each other. It's okay? Yeah, thank you, thank you. What would you do? What did you talk about? Okay, well, so, so gamify it. What else might we do? You could stand up, scan them around. Why not? Huh? Of course, the look of the, the, the look of the thing. Exactly, you know, because if it's a, if it's, if it's a palace or, or you know, a, a, a pirate ship or whatever it might be, that's what children can relate to. Okay? So look, look you, you, and I'm sure some of you would have talked about video inside. You would have talked about music, the whole ambient experience. So my message is this, actually, that the, the solution is very easy. But what, what does it take to come up with a solution? 
And this is the solution. It's the pirate ship MRI scanner, there's the animated strips to get there, there's the pre-scan video room where it's a game and there's pirates in the ship and you have to lie very still or the pirates will wake up. What do you get, by the way, at the end? A prize. Yeah, you get a, you get a treasure. So they make an experience. How on earth do PhD qualified, very, very intelligent people like doctors and engineers not see this? The reason they don't see it is they don't think. They're stuck. So actually what we have to do is think in a different way. This is how. Number one, when you face a challenge or a problem, when you're stuck, ask yourself, what is the problem? Step back from it. Because they were de defining this as a stillness problem. It's not a stillness problem. It's a fear problem. It's a psychological problem. The other thing we talk about here is liquidity. Don't, try, don't, don't fixate too quickly on the first solution that comes to mind. Generate a lot of ideas. The other thing you need to do here is be flexible. Okay? Take one route. Because, for example, what they did is they, they spent a lot of time looking at the design. But be flexible, because then they didn't just look at the design, they then thought about the audio experience. They then thought about the, um, the, 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 the video experience. You know, what's that going to involve? So be flexible in terms of looking at the bigger picture. The other thing you do here is to redefine. So they redefined this and said, you know what, we are not in the MRI scanner business. We're actually in the childhood fun experience business in hospitals. The answer to breaking this linear thinking tendency is cake. You're going to draw a cake and then you're going to cut it four times. Draw the cake, cut it four times, and your objective is to come up with the maximum number of pieces of cake. Draw the cake, four cuts, you have 30 seconds, go. Who's finished? 15 seconds. And I, I've collected the papers, huh? when I, what, and I've collected now from about 6,000 people. I'm going to collect your pages after this, yeah? This is about 70% of people, on average. <laughs> Offset cuts. Still pretty bad, Pete. Don't build it. All right, now wait for this one. Wait for this. Now, you know, hang on to your seats, people. What I'd like you to do again is stand up, and here's what I want you to talk about. First question I want you to talk about is what assumptions did I make when doing this exercise? Now, an assumption is when you don't think, it's you just do. Okay, what assumptions did you talk about? What, is, what assumptions did you make? The cake is round. Air is round, eh? One dimensional. One Cakes are not one dimensional. Eh? They're, 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 not, they're an object. Um, a lot, you did straight lines. Yeah? Many of you did the equal size pieces. You did it individually. <coughs> individually. Now, there was something else. Remember I talked about liquidity? Come up with a lot of ideas. How many cakes did most of you draw? One. You had time. Eh? Now, we'll come back to the time point in a moment. Okay, now. You made, now, not just assumptions about the cake, the process, you also made assumptions about the knife. One blade. You know, it's, it, look, look at this, and I saw some of the guys at the front, brilliant! Because what they did was called a mess. You know, the guy, what was, was, you did it, right? What's your name? Peter. Peter? Hire him. Ah, <laughs> uh, look, Peter did this, eh? Peter went like this, one cut, two cuts, right. you know? The only problem was the engineer was sitting next to him going, <laughs> you know, fantastic. Because, when, because what you did actually, and if you kept going with those cuts, the answer to this exercise is infinite. That's what Charlie did. My little boy, he just went like that. He can't even draw a straight line, you know? And, and Reese, the elder brother, what did he say? That's not allowed. The, and this is also, again, think about business. How many times do people say it can't be done? We tried it and it didn't work. Why? Because we tried it by cutting the cake in the same way. It's not going to work that way. You've got to throw away these assumptions. Now, what I'd like you to talk about now is much more profound. Where do those assumptions come from? Why did you do what you did? Because this is metacognition. This now allows you to think about the way you're thinking. So what I'm giving you now is that experience of metacognition. I'm going to ask you to think about the way you thought. What was driving that behavior? What caused you to do it? Let's go. So what happens? 
You know, I'm wonderful. And, and what's your name, sir? Heinz. Heinz. Heinz, we, we were talking. He said, you know what? Build on the ideas of other people. And most of us did this as an individual exercise. Now, why do we do Because I think that's the best way. Eh? The best way to be creative is together. The, the collective will always outperform the lone genius when it comes to creativity. Why don't we do that? It's education. The moment we step into formal Western education, it's highly individualistic. It's competition. It's ranking. It's individual tests. If you collaborate in education, what is that called? Cheating. The Western industrial age education system was designed for a linear economy, the industrial age economy, where we wanted to produce people who could follow rules, formula, efficiently. So that education system is not about divergent, it's not about liquidity, it's about fast and get it right first. It's not just the school, it's experience. Where did you see your first cake? At home, mum cutting the cake. So it's not just education, it's our experience. It's what society does to us. Eh? So these things are very, very problematic. Now, what else does that create? It creates fear. I saw a lot of people who didn't start drawing until they looked at what other people were doing. Do you understand? So what's the message here? Again, it's not complicated. We've got to question our education. It's not that our education is bad, it's just that our education is confined. You know, you've got to develop and, 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 and accept that maybe I haven't practiced this stuff. I've got to learn new stuff. So question your education. Secondly, absolutely question your experience. Now, as I said, not all the time because that's inefficient. Question your experience when your experience is not helping you. It's not working. Talk to other people. Bring in other ideas. And thirdly, it is very, very much about the environment. If you're in an environment of fear, you will not get creativity. If you're in an environment that's very hierarchical, you will not get creativity because the people at the top know. Now, this one I think everyone gets. The last one everyone gets. We talk about a business school every time. But there's a knowing doing gap. We know that we should be open. We know that we should listen. We know that we, should, we don't do it. There was some research done by Carnegie Mellon University in the US. And what they did actually was they put brain scanners on jazz musicians. Now, my dad was a jazz musician. He was a pianist. Um, and I used to see him jam, improvise with his friends. Now, what is improvisation? Improvisation is no plan. But great jazz musicians, and if you've listened to Miles Davis, you know, and, and you've listened to you know, Blue Note, I mean, it's trust. Because the musicians, they are smart people. They have a level of competence where they don't have to think about technique. But what they're able to do is trust the other. And not only just trust the other, they have to be comfortable that whatever they do will be accepted by the group. Empathy, trust, and openness is more important than time. Because honestly, it does not take a lot of time to be creative, but you do need the other things. Now, there's something else here about the brain function. So, you know, why were those musicians... Now, by the way, what did the brain scanner show? When these jazz musicians were improvising, their neofrontal cortex switched off. There was no fear. There was no inhibition. It was just being in the moment, being in the flow. Think about where you get your most creative moments. In the shower. In the shower. Absolutely. <laughs> Who said that? Who said that? Are you in there alone? <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, we, why in the shower? Because that's the one place you cannot take an iPad, a smartphone, you're taking away distraction. Now, but that's a big problem, actually. The other place we used to get this kind of free time was in the bed before we went to sleep. What do many of us do now before we go to sleep? We look at our email. We... So what you actually have to realize is that human beings, we're juggling three balls. The three balls we're juggling is family, career, and self. Which one of those three balls is the first one to get dropped for busy people? Self. You rush in the shower. You, you skip the gym visit. Because yeah? think about, where else do you get your, your creative thoughts, Fable? So shower, lying in bed at night. Where else? Come on. Yeah. Going for a jog, in the gym, taking a swim. Cycling, in the coffee shop. Step out of the environment. And research is very clear on this. Huh? The most creative ideas do not come in the office. They come in those informal office moments 
or they happen outside of the office. So that third ball is actually very, very important. People talk about work-life balance. It's not about work-life balance. Yeah? It's about reaching your creative potential. That third ball is not a luxury. It's actually a necessity for busy people. When your brain thinks, I'm about to die, now is a time to be creative. <laughs> It's, lo it's logical, it's, it's evolution. So what the, what the body does is it floods your brain with a chemical called dopamine. And dopamine is well researched as a neurotransmitter, as a creativity booster. So that's why for many of you who said, when I do sport, I'm, that's your dopamine boost actually. It's not just the moment in time you're taking away the pressure, you're flooding your brain with dopamine. Now of course, not everyone's sporty. So where else do you get a dopamine boost? Now, for those of you who like chocolate, you'll be pleased to know, <laughs> yes? Chocolate has a chemical called tyrosine. Tyrosine is a natural dopamine booster. Now, it's the, it's the, it's the dark chocolate, the 70% cacao, Belgian sort of chocolate. You take about 40 grams, middle of the afternoon, or before you go into that meeting, with a cup of coffee as a stimulant, it boosts your creativity. Now, how else do we boost dopamine? Sex. <laughs> Preferably with someone else. <laughs> so look, there's a couple of things I've, a couple of points I've made here. Number one is this: think, think about the way you're thinking. That's that's metacognition. Step back. Secondly, question, question things. Now, not all the time, as I said, but when you're stuck. Thirdly, it's not about leadership; it's about orchestration. I talked about setting the right environment. An environment where people are open, they're trusting, and very importantly, that you as a leader can leave your ego at the door. That's what orchestrators do. So your job as a leader is not to tell them what to do, it's to orchestrate their involvement, actually. That's what I mean by orchestration. You don't know how, but that's okay. And the last point, and very important point, that you should not forget, is that you should have a lot of sex. <laughs> So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great.